Yeah. Well, the this microphone's over here. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it does. Yeah, we're live. <laughs> All right. Continuing with spiritual gifts and signs and wonders and waving hats. All right. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your love and mercy and grace. We pray, Lord, that you would help us tonight, God, just to continue to learn more and more about you and how you desire to move and work through us, God, to be a blessing, Lord, to, to other people, Lord God, and to minister and to bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good to see everyone tonight. I'm going to make sure that this is close enough. I've been hearing that maybe our volume is not always easy to hear, so... Now you're going to hear me sipping my coffee. So we started talking about spiritual gifts and signs and wonders, and last week we talked about how that we're all given a gift, that once we are filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit, that God will give us a spiritual gift. And we talked about how the Holy Spirit is the promise. We call it the gift of the Holy Ghost because it's free. It's a gift, right? But it's the promise of God for our salvation to those who are born again in water and in spirit, as Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about identifying our spiritual gift, because God does want his church working in the supernatural. Amen? Amen. So because it has uh, been kind of difficult to hear, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to read the scriptures tonight. So first off, Three keys to identifying spiritual gift, the gift or gifts that God has given us. And this is like to this point because God can use us next week in something different if he so choose, right? Um, So three keys. The first one is desire. We have to desire spiritual gifts, right? Um, I think that when there are things available to us, especially from God, that God wants to bless us with, it's important that we desire those things. The second one is ability. Ability is important. And the third key is confirmation. So we're going to look at a few scriptures here that talk about those, and then we'll go into them. So Philippians 2 and 13, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and he says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it's God that works in us to help our will, to want to, to have the will to do, uh, the, have the will and the ability or the to-do part of his good pleasure, right? And then 1 Timothy 1 and 18 talks about that ability. He says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So he's saying, according to the prophecies that were given before, that through those, through that word, that you might have that ability to war a good warfare. And then Second Timothy 1 and 6, he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in you by the putting on of my hands, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we're going to talk about the desire and the ability and confirmation uh, in this first part of this lesson. So first, let's talk about desire. So what did Philippians say? It is God who works in us to give us the right desires, right? Um, To have that will to want to serve him. And I think that sometimes... It takes intentionality to allow God to have that sovereignty in our life, right? So if it's God who works in us to give us the right desires, then we need to be submitted and surrendered to God in those things. Because by ourselves, we can't do any good thing. Jesus said, in this flesh, there's nothing good, right? And even in Romans 3 and 12, it tells us that by ourselves, we can't do anything good aside from having God in us. We can't do anything good. It's God that's working in us. So since it would be a good thing to desire spiritual things, 
we can be sure that it doesn't come from God, or it doesn't come from us, rather, but it comes from God. Because desiring a spiritual gift would be a good thing. So it's God that puts that desire in us. And I think it's, that would even go towards other gifts and talents and abilities that, that we have, right? Whether you're a musician or you have some other ability, maybe um, even through your secular employment or your secular job, I think that God gives us those desires because they go along with who we are, and God knows who we are. And so he works through us in areas that he's gifted us. Does that make sense? You're all so quiet tonight. I can't read your lips <laughs> behind that mask. So the first thing is desire. The second thing is ability that he talked about in 1 Timothy 1 and 18. So God works in us to give us the ability to do that which he gives us the desire or the will to do. I think sometimes the second one is more noticeable. Obviously, if God is working through us and gives us the ability to do the supernatural, we recognize that that was God working through us, right? But what about looking back one step just to that desire? I think it's important that we understand. Have, have you ever desired something of God, but you weren't sure, is this, is this just something I want? Or is this God giving me the unction to want that? I think that's, that's at least for me, sometimes that can be kind of a challenge, you know, wanting to make sure that this isn't just me wanting this, or this isn't just me seeking this, but it's God putting that will and that desire in us. So, well, you can still run that a couple of, you know, there's uh, two or three witnesses, you know, someone might mm. say, say something, you know, that's by the it and confirm, well, it, it certainly wasn't me, it was God. Yeah, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let all things be established, yeah having other people confirming that in your life, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So, yeah, it's having that desire and then that ability. Because God wouldn't give us a desire to do something and then refuse to give us the ability to do it, right? God's not like that. He's not going to give us that desire to operate in a spiritual gift or in a certain area of his church and then refuse to give us the ability to do it. But how often do we find ourselves in that, um, uh, it's, it's going to sound harsh, but in that faithless scenario where we see there's an opportunity to be used of God, but we're like, oh, is God going to use me in this? Is God going to do it? We pray about things, we ask God to do it, but yet our faith is sometimes challenged. And it reminds me, of the man who came to Jesus, who wanted his, his uh, he wanted this prayer answered. He wanted this individual healed. And Jesus said, all things are possible to them that believe. And the man said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I think sometimes we find ourselves there where we have the desire and we know God can do it. And we even have faith that God can use somebody else to do it. But will God use me to do it? It's always, I think, easier sometimes for us to say, it, God can use somebody else, but when it comes to me as an individual, because, because of our faith, and we get challenged in that area. Well, it would be like, you know, God asks you to do something. I can't do that, God, but, but by gosh, I know somebody who I can get to do it. Yeah. <laughs> somebody that somebody else doesn't. Yeah. So it means that you don't have to actually do it. You, the job gets, needs to get done. Yeah. Yeah, we could certainly, uh, you know, maybe, and sometimes God works that way too. Sometimes God gives us the, the word, the direction, but we need to find somebody that can do it right. in certain areas. That's certainly true too. 
Um, but I think when it comes to spiritual, the supernatural, that, n- that nobody has the gift or, or I, I don't mean the gift, I mean the talent or ability on their own to do, it's easier to trust God to use somebody else to heal the blind than to trust God to use us to heal the blind, right? I know I've heard testimony after testimony of Billy Cole, whether it was uh, withered hands or lame uh, legs or what all types of miracles that were worked through his ministry when he was alive in, in Ethiopia. I mean, tens of thousands coming to the Lord and healings and signs and miracles. And yes, God can work through him. <laughs> but then when it comes to us, we're challenged, right? But if God has given us the desire, and I think all of us probably have a desire to want to serve God in that capacity, then we have to ask God for the faith to believe in that if you give me the desire, then you're going to give me the ability to do it through you. Um, There's nothing wrong with desiring to minister and serve through spiritual gifts. It's not... We don't have to think of it as, oh, just because I want to be used in, in miracles or in prophecy or uh, tongues or interpretation of tongues, uh, that there's something wrong with min- uh, desiring that. Because 1 Corinthians 12 and 31, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church in that letter of correction, he said, covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. A couple chapters later, in chapter 14 and verse 12 of 1 Corinthians, he said, Even so ye, for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. So there's nothing wrong with desiring those spiritual gifts, but certainly we do have to have the right motive, right? And he said, Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. And I think what was going on in the Corinthian church was they were edifying themselves in their spiritual gifts. And that's why Paul wrote and corrected them. So, desire... Would God bless that? You know, if you had the wrong motive, even if you're doing the the correct job with the wrong motive? I probably don't think so. Um, Well, he would he bless it? Or would he give you the ability to do it? Well, I think God's gracious and merciful, and I think he allows us to learn um, because they were obviously out of order, and Paul had to write a letter to correct them. So I think that God still used them. He said they didn't come behind in any spiritual gift, the Bible says. I mean, they had, they had all the spiritual gifts working in the Corinthian church, but... They had, some th- they had some things that needed to be corrected. So whether intentional or whether it was just out of uh, spiritual immaturity or whatever it was, Paul wrote a letter to, to correct him. But then in 2 Corinthians, he edifies him and he exhorts him and you know, says, gives him a good job. Um, tells him that they, that they were fulfilling what God had called them to do. So... Yeah, if, they, if you weren't giving God the credit, you know, for, I remember you, was it not so long ago you were talking about some people that are, that they were lifting themselves up instead of yeah. praising the Lord. Nebuchadnezzar was one and Herod in the New Testament was one, but they still, they still did the thing. It's just that they took credit for it, so then God judged them. Yeah. Right. So Nebuchadnezzar. Right. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was speaking, and that's when he got exiled into the into the wilderness, right? And he acted like a beast, and God humbled him. And Herod wasn't so lucky. Herod died from it the bible says he was eaten up of worms because they said it's the voice of a god and not a man and he took credit for it and so that was in the new testament he he died from it so don't you think that god knew their motive beforehand right but he still gave them the ability 
Let's and the opportunity. And the opportunity. Look at Saul in the Old Testament. I mean, a couple different times, you know, um, after Saul made errors, then he prophesied after that, you know. And even when, when Paul was first called, he went and he prophesied and was used in the gift of prophecy in the Old Testament, but God knew what was going to happen. So I think that God is merciful and he'll still use people, but he also is just. So, and it's going to be according to his sovereign, sovereign will. So when I say that, for us personally, as far as working out our own salvation, our relationship with God, we need to make sure that our motives are pure and right. And sometimes God will use somebody with an impure motive, and sometimes he won't, because whatever his will is and because he's sovereign. The third thing is what you mentioned already, Brother John, is confirmation. Because confirmation builds our faith up when things like that happen. So as God gives us the spiritual gift and he uses us, we're not going to be the only ones who know it. Again, it's not for fame or for acknowledgement, but it will be witnessed by the church. The Lord worked with the early church, the Bible says, confirming his word with signs following. So when they would preach, God fulfilled what they were preaching with signs following. So keeping our flesh crucified, that's important, right? Humbling ourselves, making sure our motives are pure. Um, in the New Testament, another individual um, when I think it was in Acts 8, when Philip was in Samaria, there was Simon the sorcerer. Do you remember that story? Mm -hmm. And the disciples, Philip preached the word of God, miracles were happening, and the people believed, and they were all baptized. So Philip must have baptized a whole group of people in Samaria. But none of them had received the Holy Ghost. So when the apostles came down from Jerusalem, Peter and John, and they laid hands on them, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that supernatural manifestation of God's Spirit in their life, he said, I want to be able to do this. How much can I give you? <laughs> and what? Right. And then Peter was used in the gift of discernment, and he said, I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness. And he pronounced, he, he prophesied over him judgment. And what did Simon do? He repented. He says, pray for me that none of these things happened to me so I think that even him coming out of that lifestyle that he had it was probably challenging he just didn't have a lot of understanding so our, our desire our greatest desire should be to give glory to Jesus Christ and minister his word and gifts to those who are in need amen because God has given us all a gift so if we're filled with God's spirit we should be praying and asking God to use us supernaturally, especially in the last days, especially with things that are going on in the world, because people need to know that God is real. They need to see that there's power in the church. Yeah. Amen? That it's not just a place to go because it's uh, traditionally and culturally what we do once a week. It's not just a place to go to uh, cry on somebody's shoulder, and I'm not saying anything bad about you know having a place to do that. But it's more than that. It's a place of power. We are the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. And Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do because I go unto my Father. And when the New Testament church was growing and thriving, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, it was because there was miracles and signs and wonders confirming the word of God. And people saw, hey, not only are these people preaching to me good, moral, encouraging things, but there's a supernatural sign following that. So before we get in the New Testament, let's just look briefly at the Old Testament. Um, there's many times that the word signs and wonders are mentioned in the Old Testament. A lot of it is when God was delivering Israel from Egypt. And I love, that. I love the story of the Exodus. Exodus is probably my favorite Old Testament book to read. He said, uh, Moses or the Lord told Moses in Exodus 7 and 3, he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. So what did he do before the 
before Israel was delivered out of the land of Egypt. Right, and what were some of the signs and wonders? You remember any of them? I remember I used to... The first one was the snake. The first one was the snake. The Well, not, I'm not talking necessarily about the plagues. Oh, okay. He did use the ten plagues, um, but he did use other signs and wonders. The burning bush. That was, that was one of the first ones in dealing with Moses, right? And his hand turning to leprosy and then right. turning back. Yep. The rod in his hand, like you mentioned, turning into a snake when he threw it down, then picking it back up. And then eating the rest of those snakes, is that well, that was before, though. Before he did it just for Moses, and then he did it in front of Pharaoh. Right. I think those plagues are so, and we studied and went through those before together. Those plagues are so interesting, and the sim- symbol, uh, <laughs> symbolic spiritual side of that especially since a lot of those were gods that egypt worshipped and uh some of them you know the egyptian sorcerers could replicate Mm -hmm. and some of them they couldn't right Mm -hmm. and uh so what was there there was lice there was locusts there was and i'm not going in the right order there was frogs It ate the other two snakes, two or three, or however many there were. Yeah, yep. And still, that alone didn't didn't do it. So, yeah, there was there was boils, there was darkness. And then you said, you know, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So, I mean, it looked like he intentionally wanted Pharaoh not to let Israel go. Mm-hmm. I think that. So there's two different ways to to look at that. And I've looked up that word before, and and again, I'm not saying this is an absolute, but I've gotten the impression from reading those situations where somebody's heart was hardened, it's where God put circumstances there and opportunities, but God knew the choices they were going to make. And so because of who he already was, it made him even more difficult, more upset because of his attitude that he already had. The other side is that um, that God did do that intentionally to, to show himself in his power and his might and all of those signs and wonders. Because Pharaoh, you know, said, okay, go, you know, and then he, he changed his mind. Mm-hmm. It was, yeah, and um, it was up until I think the third plague that they could replicate, and then one of them coming up, I think it was lice, they couldn't, or the flies, they couldn't replicate it, and then they said, then his sorcerer said, this is the finger of God, this this is God. So at that point, even his advisors were acknowledging that this was beyond them. So there were so many signs and wonders throughout that whole, um, that whole ordeal. And then it talks about it several times after the fact. And even in Deuteronomy 4 and 34, it says, Or hath God essayed to go and to take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs and by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes. So he, he repeated that in Deuteronomy. And then in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, after the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar confessed this. And I think it's so interesting that, um, to the best of my knowledge, Daniel is the only book where God allowed somebody else to have words that wasn't, that wasn't an Israelite. To write down because Nebuchadnezzar is writing this in the first person. So whether Daniel wrote down what Nebuchadnezzar said, but these are not the words of Daniel. These are the words of Nebuchadnezzar. It says Nebuchadnezzar, almost like he's writing it, the king unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, 
peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. So he, he knew that God was a God of signs and wonders. And it's so interesting that his son didn't even re remember or realize who Daniel was, hardly, um, afterwards when he reigned. So God definitely worked through Nebuchadnezzar. And even in the New Testament, Stephen in Acts chapter 7 refers to God delivering Israel with signs and wonders. In Acts 7 and 36, he says he brought them out. After that, he showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Daniel, after he was released from the lion's den, Darius testified, He delivereth and rescues. He worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So all throughout the Old Testament, in each of those occurrences, signs and wonders refer to the miraculous, to that demonstration of the power of God. Um, I know we've asked similar questions to this before, and we talked a little bit about but does anybody have a favorite in the Old Testament that God did some mighty work through either an individual or just by himself, but he did it as a sign or as a miraculous thing? For Joshua, when he made the earth stand still. <laughs> yeah. 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 Think about that just for a minute. The Bible says that because uh, the, the battle was raging long and they didn't want any of the enemy to escape, Joshua prayed, and the Bible says the sun stayed and stood still in the sky, which we know the sun doesn't move. It probably is. I think people have gone back and counted back the days and figured out that we are missing a day. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but just think. Now, scientists will say this is impossible, but think for the earth and everything that's moving in the earth. I mean, its core, its rotation on its axis, all of these things, it's spinning around and moving around. I forget how fast the earth is spinning and how fast it's moving around the sun, but it's thousands of it, miles an hour rotating. A thousand miles an hour rotating. So all of a sudden it stopped. You'd think everybody would just. Well, that would be probably stopping revolving around the sun, not When it rotates, it also goes like this. Yeah. So if it could stop spinning, everybody would all of a sudden fly it at a thousand miles an hour. I don't know, but if it know. stopped rotating well, around, if it's going to spin, that means it would get dark. You know, it only would stop for a quarter day. Yeah. Well, it had to slow down a lot. Because going around it is seasons. Spinning is day and night. Right. So. Right. That's our basic science lesson. Mm -hmm. Right. Powerful. That is an incredible one. That is probably the, <laughs> it, because we scale it that way. For God, it's all easy, you know. Um, but that is probably significantly the most scientific, um, the greatest scientific miracle that, that's ever happened. Although they're all miracles and they're all incredible. I always like the story of Elijah and, and the, prophets of Baal and calling down fire and then after that going up and praying seven times and saying to his servant what do you see he says I don't see anything and then the last time he says I see a small cloud the size of a man's hand rising up out of the sea and he says go and tell Ahab I hear the sound of abundance of rain I hear the sound of abundance of rain yep. so many when when they were surrounded by the Syrians and I think this was Elisha and his servants and uh, he says what are we going to do he says Lord open his eyes so he can see that there's more with us than there is with them and he saw the chariots all around the sky chariots of fire 
just incredible things. So in each of those, they were for the purpose of convincing God's people and even unbelievers the power, supernatural power of God. So if he did that then, he still wants to do it today because a lot of times the result was the deliverance of God's people, right? Or providing of something for God's people. So the New Testament, aside from the miracles of Jesus, um, signs and wonders are common throughout the New Testament from the church from the day of Pentecost forward. Uh, Peter said in Acts 2 and 22, You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. So he referred to God's miracles and everything that he did to God was demonstrating his approval of Jesus Christ. After the day of Pentecost, the church grew quickly, right? Because of that first sign, speaking in other tongues, and people heard them from all over the region, magnifying and glorifying God in their own language. So that was the first that was the first thing that they heard and they saw. And then whether it was the, the lame man at the gate beautiful or, or all of those uh, miracles that happened, Peter being delivered from prison, all of those things was edifying the church. God was working among his, among his people, and that was a major contributing factor of this growth. When they would go out and preach who Jesus was, God would fulfill his word with signs following. And even when it was tough, even when they were being persecuted, even when they had gone to prison, even when some of them were being um, killed, this is what they prayed in Acts 4 and 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, talking about the Pharisees, religious leaders, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled, it says. So there was a miracle. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word of God with boldness. So here's a few more New Testament times. Uh, and God, it wasn't always when it was something positive that God used a sign or a wonder, right? And I think of in the time of Ananias and Sapphira. New Testament, people are selling their belongings, giving to the church. Ananias and Sapphira sell something, and they bring part of the money. But they were claiming it was all of the money. And Peter called him out on it. He says, is this what you did? He says, yep, this is it. He says, why are you, you're not lying to me. You're lying to the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. You're lying to God. And the Bible says that Ananias dropped over dead. And then his wife came in later and asked the same question. And she lied. And so he says, how is it that you've agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. She fell down right away at his feet. She died, and young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. So what happens? Great fear comes upon the church and upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. So even when it's something that was very unfortunate and disappointing, God still used it to spread his word. A uh, couple other ones. Acts 14 and 3 says, speaking of Paul and his uh, companions, that they stayed in this area a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Romans 15 and 9, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Elysium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And then 2 Corinthians 12 and 12, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So it was used all throughout the New Testament church. 
miracles and signs and wonders. Not just the miracle uh, of the salvation experience. Not just, and that is a miracle. We don't discount that at all. When somebody finds the place of repentance, when somebody comes to an altar to repent, the Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one person, one sinner that repents. So that's significant. So when they receive the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, that is a supernatural thing, right? So that's a, that's a miracle. Not a miracle like we often think of miracles, but it's a miracle in their life. God gave them a new life. So God continued to do that all throughout the New Testament, not only through the salvation experience, but also, also through healings. Um, like we mentioned, the, the man at the, the temple gate, when Peter and John are about to go in, and they see this man laying there, and he's looking to them for money, right? You ever seen somebody and you gave them something, somebody in need? That's what this person was doing. He was begging. And Peter said, I don't, I don't have any gold. I don't have any silver. But what I do have, I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And so he took him by the hand, right? And he lifted him up. And he went in the temple leaping and praising God. There was another instance where Paul did something very similar because he looked at the individual and he perceived that he had faith to be healed. So there's two miracles right there. God gave Paul the gift of discerning of spirits. And so he could discern that this individual had faith to be healed. And then the, the, the gift of healing. So the man was healed. So... It has a role. It is important. It's used in the confirmation of God's word. Is it wonderful if somebody gets healed? Absolutely it is. But it's not only just for the individual and so that their infirmity is taken care of or their weakness or their sickness or whatever it is, but it's also so people can see that this is God and this is God who's doing this. In Hebrews 2 and 3, the writer asks a question. He says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So he gives the realization that these gifts are, Yes, they're to help the hurting, but they're not only to help the hurting. But they're also to help our faith, because we need that. We've talked about this before, but any time I think that any of us have experienced something in God, whether it was in a church service or whether it was while we were by ourselves or whatever it was, didn't that, did that do something to your faith? Faith changing experience that God did something miraculous I know for me it did but on the same side can we live off that one experience no. right have to what's that you have, to create relationship. you have to create a relationship with God right but he's he's allowing those things to happen because he wants the relationship and he does want to increase our faith he wants to build up our faith and draw us closer to him. I think that sometimes there's nothing wrong with looking back to those. If we're struggling in our faith, looking back to a time or maybe using that time with somebody who's brand new in Jesus has never heard it before to share that testimony with them to help build their faith. So here's a, I'll use this last verse here in John chapter 20 and 30. This is a powerful verse about New Testament miracles. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's powerful. Many other signs Jesus did in the presence of his disciples and they're not written in that book. Maybe they're written in one of the other Gospels. But John is also the one that said, even if everything was written, 
I don't think the world itself could contain the books. Right? So he says, but these things are written. Why? That we might believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and that believing we might have life through his name. So his concern has always been more about our eternity than our physical situation. Would it be wonderful if we could just through the power of God walk through the mineral clinic and heal every person in there? Absolutely it would. But I think that if God always healed everybody, what, what would happen? Because we're human. Yeah, yeah. Nonchalant. Just expect him to do it. Like air, like breathing. Expect it just to be there, right? But they're written that we might believe. So sometimes God does things just on a whim, just because maybe it's never been done, or maybe it's never been done for that person, and he's wanting to encourage our faith. As we saw in the Old Testament with the, the sorcerers of, of the Pharaoh, the devil also will attempt to amaze us through counterfeit miracles. And I've heard many times people talking about um, going to a, a seance or to a palm reader or something like that. And they say, they told me stuff there's no way they could have known. And I believe they probably did because the devil has information. He knows as much as we've told him, right? So he knows history. He knows he, he, can, he can communicate through the air. He's the prince and power of the air. So, and he can use people that give themselves over to those things, to sorcery and to witchcraft. But, but the Bible says God is not in favor of those things because he doesn't want us looking to anybody else but to him, right? And so the Bible has to be our final authority. So what does it say? Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether they be of God or not. So does it align with God's word? And the last thing to remember is that these miracles and gifts were not just for the early church. They still happen today. Amen? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we need to be praying and fasting and asking God to help us in these spiritual gifts. Amen. Jesus, thank you, God, for your word tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for, Lord, the, just the very fact that you still and that you have always been able to do miracles and signs and wonders. And God, that we would not be faithless, but Lord, that we would believe. God, that we would not grow cold or callous, but God, that we continually stir up the gift that's within us, God, and allow you to use us, God, to minister to those that need ministering to and to allow others to be drawn closer to you, God, through faith that they might be saved. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.